It's a keyboard, it's just a keyboard. What's so special about that? Well, one, it's got the Amiga name on it, and two, it's officially licensed by Amiga Corporation. And for that reason, I thought it was worth a little look at today. This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com, purveyors of quality joysticks for all of your retro kit, joysticks, adapters, arcade control parts, and more. Check them out at MonsterJoysticks.com, and we thank them for supporting the cave. Hello Cave Dwellers, welcome into the cave, our first video of 2023. You may have noticed I've been away for the last couple of weeks. I took a couple of weeks off for Christmas. I'm in for a week today and then I've got a week off next week for a, a delayed honeymoon from getting married last year. So um, just a quick review for you this week and then we'll go all guns blazing when I'm back from that honeymoon and into 2023. And on that note, a very happy new year to you all and I, I hope you had a lovely Christmas. Now, it's a keyboard. What's so exciting about a keyboard? Well, not a great deal if I'm honest, because it is just a keyboard, but we're gonna open it up and have a look at it today. The thing that really excites me as much as the keyboard itself about this is the backstory to it, because it's had a bit of a, um, a troubled time getting to this stage. It's, it's kind of miraculous that it even got made in the first place um, after the, uh, the failed Kickstarter and the history behind it. So we'll chat a little bit about that. We will, of course, unbox it. And also we'll take a look inside to see what makes this thing tick and what we can use it with. And as I said, it's an officially licensed Amiga product, which is kind of unusual outside of, say, the Amiga Forever software package, which many of you will be familiar with. Now, what I'd really hope to do today was get Jonah, the chap from Simulant, that's the company that makes this, on the show to give us the background to it, talk about his story, how he got those licensing deals and things like that. Unfortunately, he can't join us. I am firing questions back and forth to him as we go so that I can give his side of the story and we can hear the, the history behind this. But I've got a little quote from him here as to why he won't come on the show. Um, he says, I'm ridiculously shy for a 42 year old. I tend to get a bit flummoxed with video or voice calls. It's been a setback my whole life. Couple that with the fact that I sound like a cross between Steve Davis and Nigel Mansell, and I'm not the most exciting person to listen to. Don't be so hard on yourself, Jonah. I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely fine. and. We'd love to have you on here at some point because when people speak from a position of passion, nothing else matters and we'd love to hear your story. However, that being said, um, I, I respect and appreciate that he's, he's too shy to come on camera. So I'm firing questions back and forward and we will get answers to any questions that we may have along the way. We'll start with the box before we get into it and it is a very professionally finished product. One thing stands out for me on this box, which is why I've got the reproduction Amiga 1000 box on the table behind here. It's just, a, it's just a subtle thing on the box, but on the back here it says, this input device puts your typing experience a generation ahead, in business, in creativity, in gaming, and then it's got some blurb under each of these sections. Well, if we go now to our Amiga 1000 box, and as I said, this is a reproduction box. I don't have an original A1000 box. However, it's true to the original in that at the top here, it's got the Amiga system puts you a generation ahead in business, in creativity, and then it changes a little bit to the keyboard in education, in technology. And it's just a nod, an attention to detail that um, gives me hope that there's gonna be some heart and soul behind this product and it's made by someone who really does care. These little things make a difference. And it says additional adapter required for use with classic 68K Amiga computers. So out of the box, you're not gonna be plugging this into an Amiga, at least not yet. And we'll come on to that a little bit later. Now I've waited long enough. Genuinely, this is still sealed as new. I've waited till we've had the cameras on so I can share the, the opening of it with you um, authentically and we can get first impressions together. And I can't wait any longer. So let's get the damn thing open. So as we open it, I did ask the question to Jonah, what was the inspiration behind this? And he said to me that he has a few retro pies, a Mr. Win UAE on a PC, uh, plus original Amiga machines, of course. And um, it means he's got a lot of random looking keyboards all over his desk, which don't match and don't look very nice naturally. So that quite simply is where the original idea came from. And so what he did next was he set up a Kickstarter, not for an Amiga keyboard, but for a various keyboards in a retro style, which I'll talk about in a moment because, I think I've opened this upside down, there we go. We'll do it this way round. Lift the flap. 
And there is thankfully a keyboard waiting inside for us. Very nicely wrapped actually. Here it is, first impressions then. Let's go by color, very white keys on what looks to be more of an oyster white casing. So this is more akin, I think, to the A600 and the A1200, maybe the A4000 color casing. Uh, if we compare it to the A500 mini, this is actually a bit darker, but this in itself is not really true to the original A500's color. Compare that to an A520 modulator from an actual A500, you can see the color is off on the uh, A500 mini, it's a little bit darker. Also, this doesn't really match the keyboard. So we'll have to compare this, it's closer, but it doesn't really match. We'll have to compare this to a 600 and a, and a 1200 and see how it looks. Um, it's weighty, it's really quite weighty. I wasn't expecting that. I, I was just expecting a very light USB plastic keyboard. There is a lot of weight to this. It's probably the heaviest keyboard I've ever uh, experienced outside of, you know, ancient 1980s massive keyboards from the likes of DEC and um, IBM. That is a weighty keyboard and also lovely feeling keys. I'm going to have to use it for an extended period to make sure that the um, action, the pressure required to push the keys doesn't actually fatigue my hands, but that sounds nice. I do have a friend who bought a really expensive mechanical keyboard not so long ago and his colleagues made, it, made him get rid of it because it was so noisy in the office. I don't think this one's too noisy but I don't share the cave with anyone so that's fine. Got a couple of feet to stand it on. Yeah they don't feel like they're going anywhere anytime soon. Um, there's a, a groove there into which you can lay the cable so you can go out to either side, that's nice, or straight out the back with the cable and just clip it in there. I want to take a look inside and try it out, but before we do, let's learn a bit more about the background. So I asked Jonah a bit more and it started life as a Kickstarter and I remember when this was live. Here it is on the screen now. It wasn't successful and the goal was to create a range of retro styled keyboards, including Amstrad CPC style, um, Acorn style, and of course the Amiga style. In Jonah's own words, the problem was it was too big and far too much money to try and raise. So it wanted to raise £190,000, which is a lot for a keyboard Kickstarter. So the Kickstarter failed, there was lots of interest, but Jonas said the factory wanted a minimum of 3,000 units to produce each style, and he simply bit off more than he could chew. He had four or five styles planned, far too big an order, far too much money to raise. So he took his time, he says, and he took feedback from the users. He said, I went for better quality construction and expensive build quality, but all in the hope that it was worth it. He's been an Amiga user all the way through the dark years of uh, even owning an X5000. I don't know if you remember those, they were power PC based Amiga 1 computers. So even after Commodore went bust, uh, Jonah was there using it. He is an Amiga user through and through, which is nice to hear. So a real labor of love from a failed Kickstarter, lessons were learned and he self-funded this and um, come through. So here are some of the key bullet points from the website, which I'll also pop up on the screen if you're interested. We've learned, of course, it's officially licensed. It's a USB mechanical keyboard. The keycaps are sublimation printed, which apparently means the characters won't wear off or won't wear off so quickly. They'll be quite hard wearing. It's got genuine brown Cherry MX switches, which on the bullet points, it says, generally considered to be the best for both typing and gaming. Amiga style custom PBT keycaps in a traditional ISO layout. So we'll get another Amiga keyboard in a moment and we'll compare it and just see how the layout compares, how close it is to an Amiga. Green LED status indicators, a nice nod to original Amiga keyboards. Pull down feet, which we saw, which sit at three different heights. It's got a beige and cream injection molded casing and um, Windows, Mac and Linux compatible. Now, in Jonah's own words, as we continued the conversation with him, he says, I hold my hands up and admit, this is just a PC keyboard. It's never tried to be anything else, and it isn't a Commodore clone. Some people got angry that it wasn't an exact replica of an A2000 keyboard or some other model. But you know how much things cost to produce these days, and using the Amiga brand for me was a way of keeping the brand alive and to help keep the current Amiga company active too. So I'm grateful to Amiga for approving that the keyboard was good enough to be official. Even though it's a modern keyboard design, for me it still matches better than a flashing 
RGB, Logitech or black Microsoft keyboard. Start with the keycaps just to prove they are what they say they are. You can see there if we zoom in, they are indeed the cherry brown switches. You can just about make out the cherry logo on the bottom of the switch. Perhaps, hopefully you can see that. Um, authentic switches, there are plenty of mechanical keyboards on Amazon that are cherry keycap compatible, but they're not actually cherry switches. Now I'm not gonna be snobby about this. For some people, a 10 pound keyboard is absolutely fine. For others, a mid-range knockoff cherry switch keyboard from Amazon, also fine. I've used them myself in the past. There are plenty more expensive than this. This is just over hundred pounds plus tax but I certainly wouldn't describe this as an impulse purchase. You're paying for quality switches, a really nice build quality, and you are to a degree paying for a logo. How important that is, is really down to you. If you've got this far into the review, it probably means something to you. <laughs> now there is something I want to show you inside here. Put those keys back on and we'll figure out how to crack it open. Look at all those lovely switches. Now with all the keycaps off, there's just a screw to remove and then we can ease the lid off by sliding a credit card down the side or a, a more professional tool if you happen to have one. I'll go with a Waitrose store loyalty card key ring. This is obviously what they were created for. Yeah, and the same along the back. That was really easy to get into. Now this is the bit I wanted to show you. It seems simple, it's just a keyboard connector to uh, connect to the USB cable. But the very fact that it can be disconnected is because the plan in future is to allow you to actually disconnect the whole USB cable. So you would unscrew it here, take it out from the case completely and replace that cable with uh, a PS2 cable and adapter. There is room apparently for an adapter to sit in here. And then you can use it with a classic PC or you could use it with an Amiga with a PS2 compatible adapter. So um, a nice bit of forethought there. And also if we look at the PCB here, this has been made from scratch by Simulant just for this project. So you're not gonna find this in any other keyboard. How does it compare then to classic Amiga keyboards? Well, here's our new one from Simulant in the middle. Here's an original Amiga or Amiga 1000 keyboard. And this is an Amiga 4000 keyboard. So from a key perspective, the color of the keys, it's more like the later models, like the 600, the 1200, the 4000 with the slightly whiter keys. It's nothing like the A1000. And let's be honest, it's not really trying to be like any other Amiga keyboard. Otherwise it would have tried to integrate things like these grooves or it would have copied one of the other model Amiga keyboards. It is very much trying to be its own new modern keyboard. However, some people have pointed out that it's missing what to them is an important thing, the help key. You've got help here, you've got help on the A1000. Uh, we haven't got a help key here, but what uh, Simulant have done is they've made an extra keycap. So if you want a help key, you can swap out one of these other keys, put help in there and then map it in WinUAE if that's what you're using it for. And you've got your help key back. And then with that, you've got absolutely every key that you could want for an Amiga, I'm pretty sure. You've got your Amiga keys. You've also got an additional Boing Ball key over here. The Amiga keys, if you're just using it in Windows, for example, that will just pop up your start menu like uh, a Windows key. I've just grabbed an A600 to show you the, the color difference with that because we found that it wasn't quite a match for the A500, very close, but not quite. Uh, so I assumed it was oyster white, but actually it's a little bit creamier than oyster white. Hopefully the camera is picking that up. It's not an exact match, it's close, it's close, but it's not an exact match. And of course you've got the gray keys as opposed to the, the browner keys. I think brown keys would be quite a nice keycap option, um, maybe further down the line for this keyboard. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a next gen keyboard, which is 
the blacks and the reds to mimic the kind of CD32 style, which would look nice as well, particularly if you've got something like the black Checkmate or Checkmate mini case, uh, this would be a nice pairing. And now an Amiga 1200 for comparison, looks a lot more similar again because it's got the numeric keypad unlike the A600. And one thing I'd just like to point out is that the function keys are square on the new keypad and they're more rectangular on an original Amiga. If we could have got that rectangular function key row up there, that would have been a really nice touch. That would have been very similar indeed. So that's what it looks like. That's what it's made of. But what's it like to use? Well, let me show you quickly because through the magic of editing, yes, this is a different day now to when the video started. I've had this at home pretty much all week and I've even used it to edit this very video. So it has become a part of my main machine this week to really get to know it. And let's just take a look at my findings. It is of course plug and play. It's just a modern keyboard. I'm using Windows 10 and um, I found absolutely no problems with the switch over, especially during heavy editing in Premiere. Adobe Premiere is where I spend most of my time using the keyboard shortcuts. I've always got one hand down on the bottom left hand corner of the keyboard, using all of the shortcuts to, to speed up my process in editing. And um, I had no problems adjusting to it. It is a bit more clackier than I anticipated, but as I work on my own, that's not a problem. I quite like the sound of the clacks, but if you're working in a busy office, it may well annoy other people but that's just a problem of all mechanical keyboards. Or is it a flex? A flex of owning a mechanical keyboard. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about using this because it is just a modern keyboard. So you can use it in WinUAE like any other keyboard and have a smile on your face because you're using an official Amiga product to use it. It also works fine on the A500 Mini. Currently it won't work with the Vampire because that needs true PS2 compatibility. And of course we mentioned the PS2 adapter that's being worked on. So that's something that can be tested again when that adapter becomes available. It also pleased me that my main computer is black and white. My chair is black and white. So having a, a creamy, almost white keyboard to complement that setup is really quite nice. I can honestly say this is now gonna stay on my desk as my primary keyboard. And it's certainly an upgrade over my previous retro styled keyboard that looked like this. I'm surprised how much I can talk about a keyboard, but if you hadn't guessed, um, I really do like it. Now I did fire some more questions just to round off our episode today um, to Jonah. First of all, on the PS2 adapter. So the designer of the PS2 adapter that he's working with is based in Italy. So there's just a bit of a delay while keyboards and adapters are sent back and forth, just the logistics of that while he works it out. Um, so it's not ready yet. He says it's, it's slow going because of that, um, but he's confident it'll get done soon. The designer who he's working with also designed the open flops um, adapter with him, which is um, out of stock at the moment due to ch uh, chip shortages. That's another problem that's affecting all of these projects at the moment, chip shortages. So, um, you know, he's confident in the designer. It is going to happen. It's just a matter of time as to when that adapter will turn up. I did also want to dive into licensing a bit more. And um, he said for the official licensing, that was down to people wanting the logo on there. I was happy enough for making just a beige keyboard as a style nod to the classic Amiga but there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of white or beige keyboards out there that are nice. But putting the logo on really seemed to make a difference. I had a lot of comments from people saying that um, uh, they wanted the logo. So it really forced my hand and got me harassing the Amiga Corporation to ask if they'd be interested in making it official. This would make it a better tribute, but it also means that it's not just a tribute, it's actually a proper modern Amiga product. It was Mike Matalana and those at Amiga Corporation who were good enough to approve the keyboard with branding for release. Although Mike would also have to appease board members too and legal matters which are complicated when it comes to the Amiga intellectual property. So well done to Jonah, well done to Simulant for making a quality product, an official Amiga product and a product that I actually want to use and I'm happy to say to you guys, I think it's well worth the money. Check out the website, you'll find all the links in the video description as to find out more about this, to find out how that adapter's coming along, how to join the Simulant Discord server for a chat and um, hopefully it will be the first of many official Amiga products to come from Simulant, especially if they're of that quality. Thank you always for watching. As I said at the start of this program, um, I'm going to be away for another week and then we really will get into the full flow of the Trash to Treasures and the restorations and all of those videos for the rest of the year once I'm back fully refreshed. And um, oh, I'm also going to Amiga Island next Saturday. So if you happen to be going to the Amiga Island Expo, I'll be there all day Saturday. Come and have a pint with me. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. 
Okay, take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.